Well, today I want to talk to you about the upper room experience. Because the upper room was a place where God's people, where his disciples were totally changed. Now, before we can get into that experience, we need to understand something about who we are as people. You know, we as human beings, we stereotype each other. We look on the outward, uh, we see little bits and details, and we try to form a whole picture. But you know, we're almost always wrong. We place people in the categories that don't describe the full complexity of the people that we know. Well, God also stereotypes people too, but his stereotypes are perfect and accurate in all ways. And I want us to begin with, with the way that God stereotypes humanity. He places us basically within three categories of people. And I want you to open up with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're just going to briefly look at these three categories that God places all of mankind in. And with the insights that we gain here, we will better be able to comprehend what Jesus was doing with his disciples in the upper room. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, I read this. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. For he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that they may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Chapter 3, verse 1, And brethren, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now you are not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions amongst you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am Paul, and another, I am Apollos, are you not carnal? In these verses, Paul is addressing the church. He's addressing the Corinthian church in particular. But he's addressing all of Christianity. And he's basically categorizing people into three groups. He begins by talking about the natural man. Secondly, he talks about the carnal Christian. And thirdly, he talks about the spiritual Christian. So today we want to understand these three categories because each one of us fits into one of these three categories. We are either of the natural man, or we are the carnal Christian, or we are the spiritual Christian. And so we want to try to understand what these three categories actually mean. Now, when Paul talks about the natural man, he's talking about those who do not believe, who have not accepted the truth as it is in Christ. The spiritual realities that Jesus came to help us understand are spirituality, spiritual realities that they don't comprehend and don't understand. The carnal man, on the, the carnal on the other side, are Christians who have accepted what Jesus has said intellectually, but they have not allowed what Jesus has brought to their minds to change their lives. They are still living on the basis of their own resources and not on the basis of God's Spirit and the spiritual transformation that God wanted to do in their lives. Finally, we have the spiritual Christian, which are those who are living on the resources of the Spirit, those who are following in the way of Christ through the Spirit. Now, many carnal Christians feel dissatisfied with their Christian life. They, under, they, they feel sort of intuitively that they're not walking as they should be walking. There are other carnal Christians, on the other hand, who have gotten into this condition and are quite satisfied with where they are. There are other carnal Christians who are active, busy, engaged. They are glad to know Bible truth, and yet they have not totally yielded. Now, it is imperative that we know which category we are in, because according to Romans chapter 8, verse 9, the very text that we read now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So this text 
indicates very clearly to us that a carnal Christian is not really of Christ. He has not really received Christ's salvation. And so the Bible is wanting us to know where we are so that we can get the help that we need. The question that I want to address today is how can we become spiritual Christians? How can we be controlled by the Spirit? Now, to become a spiritual Christian, we need to be filled with the Spirit by Jesus Christ. We need to understand that we can't save ourselves. It is Jesus alone who can save us. I would like to follow the story of the disciples. And I would like to see how it is that Jesus transforms them from being carnal Christians to being spiritual Christians. Because this story, I think, provides the insight and the key that we need to understand how we can be spiritual Christians. Now, to look at this story and understand it, we need to open our Bibles up to Luke chapter 22. Uh, Luke chapter 22, and we'll be looking at verse 7 to 13. This is now right before the crucifixion. Jesus had been with his disciples for three and a half years already. He had been teaching them, training them, experiencing life together with them. They had been wandering on this earth, ministering to people's needs. They had sacrificed their time with their families for other people. And yet, the disciples were still carnal Christians. You know, a person can be a Christian for a long time, or he can be a Christian for a short time, and still be a carnal Christian. But Jesus was about to turn their lives upside down. Now, Jesus leads them providentially up to the upper room. And I just want to look at this, because it's really in the upper room that the transformation takes place. If you go with me to Luke uh, 22, we're going to be reading here, Uh, verse 7, starting with verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. So they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you, carrying a pitcher of water, following him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There make ready. I think it's very, very interesting to see that Jesus knew that God had prepared the way before them. God had prepared the way for them to meet a specific individual to be led to a specific place to have the last meal together with the disciples. This last meal was providentially provided for the disciples because at this meal, they were to experience very, very important things that would be life transforming. And so Jesus wanted his disciples to know that God was leading them to that spiritual experience that he wanted to provide them. In fact, they were to meet a man carrying a pitcher of water. There seems to be some significance here because in the New Testament, water is a great symbol of baptism, but it's also a symbol of the Holy Spirit and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus led his disciples here because he wanted to prepare his disciples for an infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now, what kind of attitude, what kind of mentality were the disciples coming with to this very sacred experience? Well, according to Luke chapter 20, verse 24, so if you go with me just to just a few verses forward, we read what kind of mindset the disciples had as they were preparing for this meal and while they were experiencing this meal. Now, there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Now, this text tells us that there was strife, there was contention, 
amongst the disciples. The disciples have been struggling with this very question for a long time. James and John had their mother ask who of the disciples could have the highest place and if they could have it. They clung to this favorite idea that Christ would assert his power, that he would take his position on the throne of David, and their hearts longed for the highest place in God's kingdom that they could have. So when the disciples enter the upper room, their hearts are full of resentment towards uh, James and John. Um, Their hearts are full of strife because they themselves want to be in possession of the highest position. So we see here a very clear indication that the disciples were still very much living in the carnal mindset, even though they had been with Jesus for three and a half years. Now, in other places, we read that Jesus wanted them to consider that one of them would betray him. Now, Jesus wanted every one of them to ask himself if they were the betrayer. Because in preparation for partaking of the the Lord's Supper, Jesus wanted them to prepare their hearts by looking inward, by examining their own lives. He told them, for example, that all of them would stumble, that Peter would deny him. So Jesus was pointing out that they were carnal Christians, that they were not yet ready for the Spirit of God. You know, we deny Jesus when our profession is contrary to Christ. Many deny Jesus by evil speaking, by speaking evil of other people. Many deny Jesus, and we deny Jesus by foolish talking, by words that are unkind or untruthful. We deny Jesus by shunning bearing life's burdens by a pursuit of pleasure, by thinking of ourselves. We deny Jesus by conforming to the world, by being uncourteous in our speech and our behavior. We deny Jesus by loving our own opinions. We deny Jesus by justifying self. We deny Jesus by cherishing pride and by cherishing doubt. We deny Jesus by dwelling in darkness and depression and discouragement instead of trusting in God. In all these ways, we declare that Christ is nothing to us. Jesus was getting, wanting his disciples to look inward, to see that they were living out of the resources of their own flesh. Over and over again, Jesus taught his disciples and taught us as well that there is the great danger that we too might be carnal Christians. Think, for example, of the parable of the ten virgins. They're all preparing themselves to meet Jesus, all preparing themselves to be ready for Jesus' coming. They had pure biblical beliefs. They looked forward to the second coming. All heard the call to wake up, but all were not prepared because they had not received the Spirit. So here in this story, Jesus wanted and wants us to examine ourselves, to know whether or not we are carnal or spiritual. The message to the Laodicean church, Jesus makes it abundantly clear that we're all in this danger of living as carnal Christians. There is a quote from First Selected Messages that drives us home in in my own life, in our lives. Ellen White saw in a vision a sentinel standing at the door of a very important building and, she, and, and asked everyone who came for entrance, have you received the Holy Ghost? A measuring line was in his hand and only very, very few were admitted into the building. So it's a very solemn question. Have you received the Holy Ghost? Are you truly surrendered? Are you truly dependent 
Well, how did Christ transform these disciples who were arguing, who were bitterly engaged in lifting themselves up to becoming spiritual Christians? Well, Jesus said to his disciples that that only he could do it, that only he could make this transformation. In fact, he washed his disciples' feet to demonstrate that he alone could transform their proud hearts into humble, servant-like hearts. During the communion, he pledges the power to do so. And yet, what we see in the story of Jesus and his disciples is that he has to lead them through an experience to the point where they themselves see their need for cleansing and for the infilling of God's Spirit. What does he do? Well, after they have been in this room, he brings them to a crisis point in their lives, a time of great difficulty and danger. First, we see Jesus overcome in the Garden of Gethsemane with great weakness. You know, Jesus had been the strength and the pillar of his disciples for three and a half years. They had learned to to rest on him and, and trust in him. And here Jesus was just falling apart. Not long after that, the guards and the the soldiers come to arrest him along with Judas. And Jesus is arrested. Christ is brought before different juries to be tried. And he's humiliated. And he's eventually crucified on a cross. Through this experience, their ambitions for kingdom, for power, were, were dashed entirely. Not only that, but they experienced their their failures. In the garden, they couldn't even remain awake to support their master, to pray for him, to encourage him. Then when the the enemies come against them, they take out a knife and they move contrary to Christ. And then they run away from Jesus, all showing the bankruptcy of the flesh. And then Peter denies Jesus. Now this leads the disciples to the point where self is just laid in the dust. They they see their their weakness. They see their, their failures. They don't know what to think about the future and where things are going. But all of this leads them to surrender themselves just like Jesus had surrendered himself on the cross. You know, Jesus had said in the garden, not my will be done, but thy will be done. The disciples were led to the experience of making this surrender through crisis, through doubt and disappointment about themselves. They lost trust in themselves. Now, you know, Christ allows experiences into our lives. He allows whatever is necessary to bring us to our knees because he wants continual trust and dependence upon him. But before this can happen, self must be humbled. It must be crushed. It must be broken. It must be crucified together with Jesus. We must come to the point where we can yield to Jesus saying, not I, but Christ. Forty days after Jesus dies. Jesus leads them once again. He tells them to go to the upper room. Because the experience was not done yet. The first time they came into the upper room, they were not ready to receive the Spirit. They were not ready yet to yield themselves completely to him. But 40 days later, he tells them to go back. In Acts chapter 1, we read about this. Verse 12, starting with verse 12. And we see that now they're ready. They're ready to yield themselves. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew 
Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So the second time around, they come to the upper room with humility. Together they repent of their unbelief. Together they, they surrender and they rely upon Jesus. They realize they cannot do the work that he has called them to without God's help. You see, we cannot expect the Spirit of God to be poured out upon his church unless we too are humbled in spirit, unless we too are reliant and dependent for everything upon the Spirit of God, upon Jesus. In Luke chapter 11, the disciples asked Jesus about the power in his prayer and where he got that power and, and how they could also be powerful in their praying. They asked him if he could teach them to pray. And Jesus, in the course of this teaching, teaches them how they too can receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And what Jesus emphasizes here in chapter 11, starting with verse 5 in the parable that he tells about the friend who comes to his friend at midnight asking for loaves of bread, is the importance of continual asking, continual dependence. This friend came to Jesus because he wanted bread for himself and for this uh, visitor who had come to him. And we read here that um, he says in verse 6, For a friend of mine has come to me on this journey, and I have nothing to set before him. So he realized that he didn't have the resources. He was helpless. And so he prays, he, he, he asks, he requests of his neighbor to help him. And what does Jesus draw, what kind of conclusion does he draw in verse 8? He says, I say to you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So Jesus emphasizes persistence here and the importance of being dependent on a consistent and persistent basis, realizing one's need, relying fully, and then he goes on and he, I think, ten times talks about asking, seeking. You know, he really emphasizes asking and the importance of asking. You know, we don't need to go through any particular experience to receive the Holy Spirit. But we do need to have a particular change in mind. We don't need to lose our loved one. We don't need to, you know, go through a major crisis in our lives. Um, but we need to make a full surrender. And this is the most, this is the hardest thing. It is so hard for us because we rely so much upon ourselves. And Jesus led the disciples through this crisis to bring them to the point where they were surrendered and where they could receive the Holy Spirit. But God is calling us today. And he's saying, today, if you will hear my voice, do not harden your hearts. Just humble yourself. Become a child in your mind. God has prepared you already for this day. Choose to surrender. You know, Jesus has brought us to the upper room today. He is wanting to pour out his spirit upon us as a church. He's wanting to pour out his spirit in a mighty and powerful way that we too might be his disciples in this community. And he's asking that we humble ourselves. And so as we wash each other's feet, this is a special time of humility, a time for introspection, a time for us to plead with God to make us humble, trusting, dependent upon him, that his spirit might fill us.
And this is all in preparation for the Lord's Supper when we will be remembering the pledge that he's given to us that if we make this surrender, he will cleanse us of our sins. He will restore us through his Holy Spirit and he will use us in a mighty way to accomplish his task for us. But it's all conditional upon us making that full surrender. There is just one quote that I want to end with today, and that's from The Desire of Ages. Only those who will become co-workers with Christ, only those who will say, Lord, all I have and all I am is thine, will be acknowledged as sons and daughters of God. May you and I become truly sons and daughters of God. And so when we talk to each other, let's talk in whispered voices, hushed voices, and let our thoughts be upon Jesus and what he has done for us and how he has prepared us to receive his spirit. May God bless you.